This is the Gang of Witches Ibiza podcast, hosted by Joe Yule. Each new moon, we'll explore with our guests how to think globally and act locally with ecofeminism. Awaken all your senses. The spirit of the witches comes to your ears. Welcome back to the Gang of Witches Ibiza podcast. And in 2012, I remember clearly walking down the street on Avenida de España when I first arrived on Ibiza and seeing a huge 10 metre wide banner that read Refugees Welcome. I recall clearly thinking how proud I felt to be living in a place they truly welcome those who are not from here or even just passing through. But recently it just crossed my mind in the absence of this flag now that maybe things had changed. And what happens to refugees or migrants when they arrive here? Migration is the real epidemic of our time. Right now, we're seeing record levels of people leaving their homelands in sheer desperation to attempt to find a better or more secure future for themselves and their families. So often the catalyst for that movement is due to extreme weather or human rights violations, environmental or economic hardship, or even civil war. And globally, in the last decade, the refugee population worldwide has more than doubled. Last year alone, we saw 30 million people displaced due to climate change, and that was three times as many people as the rest of those reasons. According to the United Nations, 82.4 million people around the world have been forced to flee their homes, and amongst them, 26 million are now refugees, half of whom are under 18. This is the highest population on record, and predictions are that things are set to worsen as the world begins to get warmer. So what does it mean to be a refugee? What kind of danger do people face? What are people running from when they arrive in Formentera or Menorca, Mallorca and Ibiza? And how is the system working for them in the Balearics? What are the biggest issues we personally face in the midst of this crisis? To try and find some answers, I went to Formentera to start the ball rolling. As last year, more than 500 migrants arrived on 36 boats. And Rafael Ramirez, the third vice president of the Conseil Insular de Formentera, who is also head of social welfare, transparency management and housing, made some time to explain to me how they deal with the issue. Es un fenómeno complejo que, que comienza de una forma... Well, it's a complex phenomenon. People started arriving in 2019, in the summer of 2019, and little by little it has been increasing in such a way that now it is a phenomenon that concerns us because we understand that due to the quantity of migrants, it has become a migration route. What are your main concerns about the situation that we are experiencing at the moment? Bueno, lo que lo que más nos preocupa es la seguridad, ¿no? Es decir, son personas. Well, what we are most concerned about is their safety. That is, they are mainly people coming from Algeria. Normally, the profile of migrants, although this summer has changed, is that there are some people who come from other places that are more distant. So we understand that there is a route, and we are concerned above all about the safety of the trip they make. Obviously, it's a humanitarian problem. How would you describe, in your opinion, the situation that these people are escaping from? Fundamentally, as part of the migratory movement coming from Algeria, we're always talking about that, and those of us who live here, it has to do with what the migrants tell us. It is their inability to develop a life project. So what they are looking for is an opportunity. Then, in addition, with the pandemic, the borders, their end are closed. Algeria is a closed state and you could not enter or leave because of the pandemic. And so they have escaped. 
That is to say, the pressure of social, political and economic situation in Algeria and the lack of a future made them decide to take this leap of faith. But what I really wanted to know, after many trips walking around the island looking to witness the integration process, was what it meant to be a migrant arriving on Formentera. Were they really welcome? It is a society. If you know Formentera, it is a plural society where there are about 90 nationalities, where there is a cordial coexistence, where people make their lives, where perhaps the link that is there from other regions, whether that is Latin America, whether that is Northern Europe, whether that is Morocco or even the Algerian community. They all get along great. Here in Formentera, in fact, we do many things in common and we collaborate. The attitude is normal. It is a very quiet island where people live with the concept of intermixed cultures and they are clearly defined and clearly assumed. It is enriching. There is no rejection from Formentera of the Bleric Islands. There is no rejection. What happens is that for them, for the profile of the people that come to the Bleric Islands, it is not their destination because they do not want to be here. That is to say, why do I tell you that? I mean, the miners who are subjected to the protection system of the Conseil Insular, once they are able to escape, they leave the centres and they are educational centres. They are centres where they are trained, accompanied, monitored, their basic needs are covered and they go wherever they want to go, to Belgium and France, where their network is. It is not an issue of rejection of migration in the Balearic Islands. This felt like music to my ears to know that refugees or migrants were indeed still welcome and even helped, according to Raphael, almost 10 years after I saw that sign. Wandering around the town of the island's biggest conurbation or overstretched village of San Ferran, I did see some faces of those who looked like they were not from Formentera. I stopped a couple of people and spoke to one man called Ibrahim from Morocco, who told me he was happily living and working on the island, but didn't wish to chat on record. I went to the local radio station, Radio Ia, and chatted to some of the presenters there, who told me that a few days previously, a photographer had taken some pictures of a family who washed up on the shores in the north of the island in a tiny patera or small boat. And Franco had, in their words, humanised them by the kind of images he captured of them. Studying the photograph he took, I saw a mini community of around 10 people smiling. Their success story of escape was imprinted on their features, almost a kind of elation to be found by a man who welcomed them. I tracked Franco down and chatted to him on the phone, but he was sadly leaving the island that day for winter to work in South America before I could grab some time together. Again, I wondered, were all those who landed on Formentera receiving such a warm reception? The immigrants from Algeria right now are settling. They are coming to Formentera, to Ibiza, Manoka, Mallorca, right now, but arriving everywhere. They are in Greece. The migratory flow is a global problem. There is not a local problem. There is not a local solution. Formentera is too small to manage. I mean, I can make the arrival procedure when they arrive to treat them better and be sure that their human rights are being respected, they are treated with much affection. But the solution of the problem is a problem of social justice. It is not a problem of specific person who makes a migratory leap to another country. It's a social justice issue that no one should leave their home because they have no future. I had also read about a possible radar being installed in Formentera soon to keep an eye on the waters, and I wondered how the migrants were even detected when they arrived, as so many of them seemed to make it ashore before they were found. Detectar es, es una misión es una misión de, de los fuerzas de las fuerzas y cuerpos de seguridad, ¿no? Detectar eh, la, la, la afluencia de pateras. Well, detecting their arrival is a mission. It is the mission of the forces, law enforcement, to detect the influx of small boats. We work with windows. There are moments. For a temporary window, that is to say when the weather conditions are good, to be able to make the crossing, a crossing can last six hours. If it is a fast boat, or 30 hours if it is a very small boat. When we are notified that there is a temporary window, that is to say the conditions are right for migrants to arrive, we keep a lookout because we already know that it is possible. Do you see them in Formentera? 
Yeah, it is very small. So as soon as they see a boat approaching the coast or they see migrants walking along the road, residents call us and immediately the protocol is activated. Bueno, porque no, no olvidemos que funcionamos, España funciona en esta situación. Well, because let's not forget that we function. Spain functions in this situation as the border of the European Union. That is to say, the European Union is the one that has the rules of how we make this transition, this migration. And obviously what happens is an irregular entry. There is no regular entry through the border without a residence permit or without a work permit or a vacation permit. What we are doing is law enforcement. Obviously, there'll be a lot to discuss in the area of human rights. That's another matter. Essentially, I had heard what I needed to know. Migrants get detected. They are then picked up, clothed, fed and watered and dried off and put in a van to go to Ibiza as soon as humanly possible, where they enter a CIE centre, a kind of immigration holding area, until they could be released. And since COVID, they couldn't be sent back, which is why, since 2019, migrants have been coming in their droves at a vastly increased pace and capacity. But I needed to know how dangerous that journey was, and asked one final question before I left the Centre de Benestar Social with Mr Ramirez. The um, figures about, you know, deaths or accidents, you know, this year specifically, since the problem increased dramatically, has there been any actual data processed about how many deaths have, have uh, occurred from people making that journey to come to Formentera? The one about a month ago was a boat wrecked in Mallorca and three people were found dead. Three people were found dead in Mallorca, not for Montero. No, so far there have not been any because it is what we were talking about before. Take advantage of that window when the weather conditions are good. On September the 20th last year, an article in the Daily Bulletin in Mallorca reported 17 pateras carrying 268 people arriving in the Balearic Islands. 140 arrived in Mallorca, 106 in Formentera and 19 in Ibiza. That was according to the government delegation. I had seen regular contributions also to the Diario de Ibiza on migration from a journalist called Carmelo Canvalio. He lives in Formentera and has done since 1985. I went to meet him in San Francisco for a conversation as to why he feels this situation for migrants has become so desperate. La situación en Argelia es muy complicada. The situation in Algeria is very complicated. The structural situation of the country itself. The economic situation has a serious infringement and a government that is based on a corrupt system that defends the high officials, the military and the police. That means that if you are between 20 and 35 years old in Algeria and you're not married, this is an important detail because of the culture they have, you have nothing to do educationally. There is no way out and no job. If you're young, you have no future. So this causes a whole generation of young people to have no hope. These men who arrive, most of them are men, but now some women are coming too. This situation, which was normal, has worsened with COVID and the closing of the borders that Algeria has done due to COVID. Even if you have money in Algeria and you want to leave, you cannot. I give an example of the seriousness of the issue because there is a lot of shortage of basic commodities in Algeria. If you are sick, for example, and you have a family member who needs oxygen, there is no oxygen and no matter how much money you have, you can't buy oxygen for him. It is a country that in the cities, Oran, Algiers, are more or less Europe hoisted. But all the migrants who arrive do not come from the cities, they come from the small villages of the interior. With a very low level of culture, with or without any future, and those who come here by geographical proximity come from an area called Burmedes. The young people who live in the cities can still more or less get ahead a little bit, but the people who live in the villages, in rural environments, they don't have access to anything. 
there is a very big difference. You have to think that Formentera is 169 miles north of this region, closer as the crow flies than Barcelona. So that region, Bormedes, is a region that historically has been very neglected as well. And why is that? Because it suffered a very important earthquake in 2003, and nobody did anything afterwards to fix it. Also, in addition to the 2003 earthquake, in the month of August, there was a big fire, and all the olive groves and all the fruit trees, especially pears, were burned. The earthquake measured 6.8 on the Richter scale, and its epicenter was located near the town of Thinia in the Bormedes province, approximately 60 kilometers east of the capital, Algiers. It shook the town on the 21st of May and was the most powerful earthquake to have affected North Africa since 1980, when northern Algeria was once more struck. This tragic disaster in 2003 led to the death of more than 2,200 people, injured more than 10,000, and left at least 180,000 people homeless. And these people were left in tragic circumstances. Voy a explicar ahora la motivación de los jóvenes por venir aquí. I'm going to explain now the motivation of the young people for coming here. What do they want when they come? Almost all of them are men. As I say, although women have come here and pregnant women have come here as well, but most of them are a very small percentage. Most of them come here and they already know they're going to be detained. They do not want to stay in Spain. They know that in Spain, irregular entry is an administrative offence, not a criminal offence and that they are subject to or an order to be returned to their country. But the loophole is that, as Algeria has had its borders closed, the nationals could not be returned due to COVID. Young people coming to Spain from Algeria want to go to France or Belgium because they have much closer family relations, in the same way that Moroccans prefer Spain. Algerians prefer France and Belgium as former colonial countries in the area. So, when the young people come here, many of them are usually seen by the neighbours first, and then they are warned. The Guardia Civil arrives, detains them and gives them a kit. This is how they are treated. They give them a kit which includes dry, clean clothes and shoes too. Because they usually arrive wet, they feed them, and from here they are immediately transferred to Ibiza because in Formentera there is no infrastructure like Ibiza, to be able to attend to all those who arrive here. There was one weekend that 140 people arrived. Formentera is a mousetrap because they can't get out, and then the people who have been helped them have no way out. They cannot stay on an island of 11,000 inhabitants. Their objective is not that. Their objective is to reach Spain. European territory. Spain is the closest. And then as they know that in Spain they are going to pass the Guardia Civil, Policia Nacional, because the Guardia Civil sends them to Ibiza, but in Ibiza they are caught by the Policia Nacional. When they arrive in Ibiza, National Police has 72 hours to work things out. It depends also if there is room in the CIE, they know this. Then they send admission details and put them in. They put them in a, a CIE, but if the CIE are full, they give them a letter and they are free men and they can go wherever they want. Let's look how it is in Formentera. It is true. It is not a real problem, but people, society, is concerned about the arrival, but more from the human point of view than from the point of view that they feel invaded or attacked. Let me explain. From a national point of view, it is true that all this has generated a political debate on the need to strengthen the southern border of the Mediterranean, which is us and Palma, and also from Europe. But yes, but it is also a diplomatic problem, because at the moment the bilateral relations between Spain and Algeria, and bilateral Spain, Algeria Morocco, are complicated by the gas issue. There is a pipeline there. there. There were two pipelines between Algeria and Spain. One enters through Almeria, which is direct, between Algeria and Spain, and another one enters through Morocco. 
The second one, this second one from Morocco, because of the problems of, that Algeria and Morocco have. Algeria has closed the passage of the gas through Morocco, which reaches Spain and Europe. So there is an underlying political, economic and strategic problem, and many times governments use irregular migration as a weapon. Now, recently, and within diplomatic talks that you're seeing, Algeria has opened a small window for the deportation of its citizens. This has allowed Spain to reopen the CIE so they're able to empty the internment centers. Now that means that they can stay a maximum of 40 days. It's a system that conforms to the legislation, but for me it is not. I don't think it's the right one. The problems of immigration have to be tackled at source, that is, in the countries where they come from. People who are willing to die for a better life, it is necessary to look for solutions in their countries. As much as this messiness felt, to some extent, an issue that was being addressed in terms of the way the arrivals are treated and met, the question marks, for me, remained over the danger. Six hours on a speedboat, maybe up to 30 hours on a smaller, slower boat, according to Rafael Ramirez. But the weather and the size of the boat is not the only issue. Es sencillamente, y España hace muchos esfuerzos y salva muchas vidas, ¿eh? It's simple, and Spain makes many efforts to save many lives. We can criticize many, the Guardia Civil or the National Police, for the repression at the fence in Melilla, but we must applaud when they save lives in the Canary Islands. On the Atlantic coast, in the Mediterranean, if we look at Syria, Libya, there are human cemeteries. We should all be ashamed of ourselves. I started researching what measures were being taken to address the situation, as it felt like with this huge change in levels of humans arriving on the island, more work to locate them or help them if they got into trouble was needed. And I saw an article that mentioned the purchase and installation of a radar. The system is useful. It's called that way and it's a radar system of the Spanish state, which exists in certain places. We have a lot of sea, a lot of coast, and it's fundamentally an aid system that is used both for fishing boats in Galicia in the north when there are bad seas or extreme situations of boats and to detect small boats. The Spanish state is very clear about this. The priority is to save lives. Then we will see what happens with the papers. I think it's just another tool. In the end, it is a response to the medium, if nothing happens. It's also true that sometimes they use radar to detect smuggling ships carrying drugs. As the problem has grown, resources have been put in place. As the Ibiza police station became too small to accommodate 200 people for 72 hours, another facility was opened. The Red Cross works hard to support all those who arrive. They go through health checks. If they are sick, they are cured and treated because they're not criminals. We have to forget they are not criminals. They are people who have committed an administrative offence, not a crime. I think it's the right way for the situation. Maybe there are people who don't feel the same way here, but I think it's the right way. There is one thing I don't like, for example. When they detain them, they handcuff them, and there is justification for that, because it is true that there have been fights between them, and there have been security problems between them. I'm not a policeman. I don't like the attitude, and I know that there are some policemen who treat them badly, but they are few. There is a great awareness of the role that the police and the civil guard have to play in this sense. Carmelo stopped our interview to answer his phone. He took a call, the contents of which I could only just make out, concerning a dead body. As he came off the phone, he seemed to be a little bit sad and slightly shaken. I gently asked him what had happened. Sí, bueno, desgraciadamente hablamos de los vivos, de los detenidos. Yes, well, unfortunately, we talk about the living, about the detainees, and we tend to talk little about the dead. And there are dead. There are dead people that are not all on the small boats that arrive today. Pateras that are shipwrecked are boats five meters long, where 12 people are on board. And we received one, one on the 12th of October in Formentera. The body arrived, which was later officially identified, 
and was that of a woman, although her being an immigrant has not yet been established. We know this through a social mediator who is in contact with the families of the migrants, the families of Algeria, that generally the migrants, when they say, we have arrived, I'm fine, but there are people who never call. Carmelo told me about the lady he took the call from, a woman living on the mainland who was from Algeria originally and who helped him to trace the families of the dead and also helped them find their family members. Because he admitted once people make it to dry land, they usually let their families know back home. But too frequently, there are those that never get to make that call. After this interview ended on Formentera, we tried to get a ferry back to Ibiza with the car But as the howling winds picked up and waves began to crash, we quickly found out there were no car ferries going back. We were offered the option to leave the car and be foot passengers. But as the depth of that privilege sank in, that we had the choice to stay or go, I realised for those in Algeria who make that crossing, there is no choice. The next day, I called the woman who helps families find their loved ones who make that crossing from Algeria. Her name is protected for the basis of this interview, but she told me I could call her Lilia. Her voice is replaced by a local female island resident to protect her identity. I am of Spanish nationality, but of Algerian origin. To me, at my language level, it allows me to write and speak in Arabic which makes it much easier for the relatives when they contact me to translate and help them to look for their family when they have no one else to turn to for help other than the one who comes here in Spain, like me, to look for the information they want. Most of the parents contact our family because they know that we speak Spanish, so they get in touch to try and find out if their children have arrived or not. My father was an immigrant in the 90s. Then, by 1999, we all came uh, as a family to Europe. He organized that. And luckily, we did not come on a boat, which was a huge occasion of love within our family and a moment we will never forget. How do you feel about this issue, that immigrants have to risk their lives to try and make a better future? It's not what I think, but what we have noticed. I give you an example. Last year, in December 2020, there was a return of three boats from Almeria to Algeria. Out of the boys who were in the center in the CIE of Barcelona in Zona Franca. These people were 43 boys and now only half of them have returned home. So half of them do go back usually, but they never get tired of crossing the Mediterranean to get to the European dream. We are always asked, have they arrived safely? Have they made it to Spanish soil? But is it the next one? What's that going to be like? Is it going to be death? Is it going to be another disappearance? Or is it going to be another arrival again? It leaves the mothers living in a fierce hell, at least the first 72 hours. Once a body is recovered, and we know who it is, it puts an end to the family's grief. We started to hear of disappearances in October 2019, and that started around the 17th of that month. In October 2019, there were seven missing boats, with no bodies recovered. So, the big question mark hangs on the fact that the sea is small, it's like a swimming pool in the Mediterranean. And it's not normal that you can't recover any corpses from any patera. It's mysterious. Because in reality, always when you are shipwrecked, you always get over 50% of the corpses that wash up somewhere. But when they are not recovered, nothing? We have a big question mark. Where are these boats or parts of that boat? Or what has happened to them? Sometimes their phones ring after the set-off or messages can be sent, so we assume that they get those messages. But when it's a phone at sea, they don't always get those messages. Sometimes WhatsApp is turned on, roaming is turned on, messages are read, 
and not answered from a missing person since three or four months. This is when it happens. That it feels like there is something wrong or unexplained. I asked her about the woman who was washed ashore in Formentera when Carmelo was on the phone. It was very, very painful yesterday. When I spoke to the mother of the girl that I was talking to Carmelo about to find out what we knew about this woman, because all night long I was looking at that photo and of that picture of her son. Before my eyes, I could not sleep thinking about her child. The child she left with and where? Where was her child? It hurt me a lot. I am a mother too, and I can't explain it to you. My feelings in this situation. There was a mother of another boy on the same boat that was with this woman. And all night she was calling me, begging me, saying, please help me, and you can't leave this mother in agony. You have to keep working to give the minimum information to this mother, to the grandmother of the child. Where is the child? Has the child's body been recovered? Is the child alive? Is he safe? It's just when you get drawn in, like in the story, you can't separate yourself. Three days after I spoke to Lilia, an article was published in the Diario de Ibiza by Carmelo, confirming that the woman who was washed ashore on Formentera was called Feriel Larule, and she was just 23. It emerged she had set sail with another man, Usama Bayaru, who was 20 years old. Their bodies were, according to the article, found between October the 20th and 23rd in Estufador and Espalmador in Formentera, both of them drowned at sea. After hearing the stories of desperation and the complexity of what it is to be a migrant, the sense of utter fear upon arrival, but also of leaving loved ones, the worry about safety to be on the seas, to not always be as welcome as you would wish, to not speak the local language or know whether you will be detained or not, or how full the CIE will be, if new rules have emerged to change the outcome of that stay, or if it will even be needed, or if you'll be set free, or whether the gas pipes are being blocked or unblocked, and how politics and money can also play a hand in your fate. After all of that sank in, and to then read this article and be reminded that last but not least, whether you will even make it at all, felt like a huge blow, and an example of just how brutal it is and will remain to be as a migrant. The unknown, the uncertainty, the risk, and the questions of how do we heal this situation? How do we welcome with open arms? How do we be kind and remain open and work towards an enveloping system and one that opens its arms, lends a hand even more than it does now to assist and keep on assisting? We end today's podcast with the words of Ibiza Preservation Director Inma Saranova from episode 13 in January because Inma has studied migrancy and when I asked her what she feels needs to be done, she told me this. Considero que no existe ningún problema migratorio ni en Ibiza ni en el resto de España. Tampoco existe... I believe that there is no migration problem in Ibiza or in the rest of Spain beyond the simple facts that the migrants themselves face laws in Europe and Spain which do not take their human rights into account. That is the real migration problem. We're not in a situation, despite what some people would have us to believe, in which our status quo or our well-being as people from the north is in danger because of migrants arriving in Ibiza. If anything, without immigrants on Ibiza, there would be no Ibiza. Without immigrants, there would be no people working to create the wealth that there is on this island. And that should make us rethink whether the distribution of the wealth that is generated even by these people, the working people, is really balanced and fair. If we come to the conclusion that it is not, which is my personal viewpoint, then we should start working to change the situation. Thank you so much for joining me on today's Gang of Witches Ibiza podcast. We'll see you next month on the new moon. It was the Ibiza podcast of Gang of Witches, hosted by Joe Yule. See you at the next new moon. Until then, take care of yourselves.